So in your book about how economists fail to predict prices, you spoke about how after 2008, we will be going into a downfall phase of the quadratia cycle. And so far, the world economy is in a slowdown. So what do you think will be the tipping point for this recession? Well, you know, what, what's interesting about that is I was trying, this is a book called Hubris. My book is Hubris, uh, the subtitle is Why Economists Fail to Predict the Crisis and How to Avoid the Next One. Uh, I, you see, what happened in economics is that after the Keynesian Revolution and after the post-war period, the phenomenon of business cycle almost disappeared. And so people even stopped discussing business cycles. There was even a book called Is the Business Cycle Obsolete? And so when 2008 happened, it was a complete shock. It was the first time a, a really deep financial crisis had happened in Western capitalism. So the question was, what was the, what was the future? Now by that time, economic theory, uh, what's called new, new classical economics, had got to the stage, I don't know if you know of the new classical economics, had got to a model of rationality what's called rational expectations model, which says that a crisis cannot be <coughs> predicted because if you could predict it, you could act to nullify it. You know, if you expected the stock market to fall, you would go and do things to profit from that, right? Now, that would be not the case, but uh, so when the crisis happened, a number of people, Robert Lucas, who was who won the Nobel Prize and was a leader of macro of new classical macroeconomics. He said, I make no apology. In my model this doesn't happen. And it even if it will happen, it is unpredictable by the nature. Which is very silly. Uh, because there is a whole old tradition where capitalism goes through cycles. <coughs> you know, it's a tradition from nineteenth century. Marx was for, for the first person more or less who theorized about cycles and then other people did. Now, these cycles are not absolutely clockwise regular. But some people have small cycles, theory of small cycles, you know, short cycles, long cycles. One was of 10 year cycles, other was of 50 year cycles, the, the contrario. And so I was speculating that we ought to now go back to the long cycle logic and explore that because you consider the price in 2008, it is not guaranteed that there will be one in 2050, but that you have to get used to the idea of long cycles. And long cycles, you know, for example, for the last 10 years, 11 years, the Western world has not had really serious growth rate. The Western Europe hasn't had a growth rate anywhere, or even up to present. Uh, America has been slightly better uh, in, uh, since uh, uh, Trump came to power and had a tax cut. But it clearly indicates that now Western capitalism is going through a phase of slow growth and everybody is predicting there might be another recession. So around a 50 year cycle, you may have short cycles of 10 years. And it's anybody's guess. Because it is not clockwork. It is a heuristic way of thinking, but it's very likely that we may have. I mean, German economy has slowed down considerably. Uh, sorry, CLBC, so I think they must be wanting my advice or something. I'll just switch it off. Okay. Oh. Uh, so, in a sense, uh, the German economy is slowed down, the British economy is very slowed down, uh, and it may very well be that uh, they will continue to be in a short cycle, and we don't know when the upside of that cycle will come. So, I mean, it's a realistic way of thinking about it. Now, obviously, uh, if you think about it, uh, the Chinese economy has slowed down, and the Indian economy has slowed down. Now, how much they rely on domestic markets and how much they rely on the international market is, is an open question. But there is no doubt that something is going on which has slowed the economy down. 
Yeah. Next. Yes. So, so my question. Yeah. Sorry. So, so, sir, my question is related to Brexit. Although the topic has been discussed a lot, but I feel there, that there has been less talk on the implications of Brexit on London as a financial hub. So, right now we know that London is the largest exporter of financial services in the world. And, but the problem is that a quarter of its exports come from the European Union alone. So, uh, what do you think will be the implications of Brexit on London as a financial law? Okay. Um, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Straightforward question. Now, now two things. London, London was a big financial center before the UK joined uh, the European Union. Uh, and indeed, uh, London, soon after they joined the European Union, not because of the European Union, uh, the city became a very... Uh, very competitive, very revolutionary place, and currently it is still the top financial center. Now, the only way in which being a member of the European Union affects the city is that there is a common set of financial rules which all members of the European Union have to follow in terms of uh, you know retail bank behavior and all this sort of stuff. And for a bank, for a UK bank to operate retail deposit, take retail deposits anywhere in the European Union, it needs a passport. It's a passporting service. So the passporting service will cease when UK exits. UK will formally exit sometime before 31st of January. And then UK and EU will work out an arrangement of what's called a third party third country arrangement of trading with the EU. And that means that they have to agree on tariff rules and import export rules and rules about financial services. Now financial services rules, what they have said is that they will go by something called equivalence, i.e. that as long as the UK is following the rules laid down by the EU, there will be straightforward financial relationship. But if the EU changes its rules, London will have to adapt and change its rules. Now the, the paradox is that a lot of the EU rules are framed by London. Because London is a dominating financial center and in the global financial context, there is a financial stability board uh, at, at the IMF. And the Bank of England governor is the chairman. So London was the shaper of financial rules. So the paradox that London is out and these guys are saying, if you don't behave like what you... And so we will see how that is. But another thing is that by and large, London is used by the European Union countries to raise money. European country businesses, they raise their money in London, it's the largest equity market. So it is in their interest not to frame rules so that they have to go to Frankfurt or Paris, which will be much more expensive places to raise money than London. So we will see. I mean, I, I've, been, I've been on a committee in the, in the House of Lords on financial affairs with the EU, and I, we, we came to in the by and large, uh, to begin with, we thought that the city firms may move into uh, Europe, but none of them moved. They took the view that they have inbuilt advantage of expertise and that the Europeans will come. The only thing is that New York may gain more. Uh, but for a while, the EU thought that they could take over the Euro business. But it's, it's, it's too complicated and too technical for that uh, to happen. So I think it will not affect very much. Uh, but idea of, you know, it's, it's like, you know, it's like when India was growing, we had import substitution industrialization. You know, even if your own industries are inefficient, you want to have your own industries. It gives a kind of extra island mileage to pick roots. Um, so Frankfurt and Paris are trying to develop slightly bigger markets. But in global ranking, Frankfurt and Paris are not within the top ten. So, you know, so it's, it is really a disadvantage to go to your local local hut and you know buy a 
to buy a dinner when you could have a restaurant next door. Anyway, <laughs> so we'll see. I don't. I, I predict not to be a very large effect on London and the country. With manufacturing, it's very different. The physical movement of goods, <coughs> is, uh, goods is very different. Yeah. Well, this side is losing. This two men. Okay. Yes. Gentlemen there in the back. Good afternoon, sir. My question is rather political. So, as a member of the Labour Party in the United Kingdom, I wanted to ask you if there is actually a growing anti-Indian sentiment among the Labour Party in India, given there have been specific instances in the past which contribute to the same. Say, for example, Mr. Corbyn saying that they, he will try to ban Mr. Mo Mr. Modi from coming into the United Kingdom and not going to meet him there. Or, say, people from specific areas like Lesser East, Lesser East not being elected. So, do you think there is an anti-Indian sentiment among yeah. the Labour Party? Yeah, my, my first question is, who the hell cares? <laughs> what the Labour Party thinks or doesn't think? I'm a member of that. You know, I, what I find very surprising that India is extremely sensitive to Western criticism. If somebody in Indonesia denounced, nobody will blind it to it. Nobody even knows what Indonesia or Malaysia or China think. And one English newspaper says something and people say, what are they doing? Anyway, that's the culture of our country. You know, I tell you what happened. I, I have been in the Labour Party for 49 years. There was a time when, uh, by and large, Labour Party recruits uh, low-paid workers, especially migrants for low-paid workers. So, for example, in 1992, we had an election, and I was sent to every constituency where there was an Asian vote, <coughs> so-called. Now, Asian is a very, very ambiguous word because there are Miripuris and that there are people from Pakistani Punjab and from Indian Punjab and there are people from Bangladesh. And they have very different perspective on Indian problems, especially Kashmir. So, almost every constituency I visited in 1992 the only thing that the Asian would want to discuss was Kashmir. Seriously. No other issue, no relevant British issue was at all discussed. And they had different views. Milburis wanted one thing, the Indian Kashmir wanted another thing. So what used to happen, we would have a conference. And at the conference, there would be different resolutions on Kashmir. And we would compose that gap. We would kind of melange them up. So nothing, nothing concrete to what happened in the last 25 years is that the professional Indian middle class has moved to the Labour Party. And they've gone to the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party has made a determined attempt to lure them away. Because they are they're business people, they like private schools, they, you know, they like low taxes. They have different kind of perspective on life compared to the uh, working class uh, Asians. So, the the Labour Party is left with uh, the lower-paid Pakistani and Mirpuri and Bangladeshi workers. So that view is reflected in the Labour Party resolution. You know, and in, in, in India's image is not very good outside on human rights, let me tell you. Uh, you may care or not care for it. So that is what, and uh, uh, Corbyn has always, throughout his career, he's been for Palestinian rights, and like that. he's always been for the underdog. So that's what happened. But you know, I don't think Indians should care. It doesn't matter like this. Who cares? Who cares what, 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 uh, what uh, resolution the Labour Party passes? <coughs> okay? Yeah, sir. Yeah, so given uh, things like the Yellow West protests in France and the anti CA protests in India, which are basically either left protests or anti right protests. So even in my peers, I personally, and a lot of people personally see, be it the students or be it uh, the educated youth. So there has been a growing tendency to shift towards the left. So in your opinion, is this because of some merit that the left's ideology is attracting them, or is it because of a desire to dissociate, disassociate themselves from the right? When you, when you are young, you want to be opposite of the given wisdom. I mean, if you're not left-wing at 18, you'll never be anything the rest of your life. Okay, so, you know, but also what happened, you see, 
It was never fashionable among the very young to be right wing. You know, right wing, being right wing was not sophisticated because Indian right wing has never been a secular right. There is no secular right wing in India at all. So right wing in India is religious right wing. It may be Muslim, it may be, it may be Hindu. I mean, just because you are Muslim, it doesn't mean you are left wing. Uh, you know, so. Right in, in, in India, there's never been a secular. India, there's never been a political party which believes in the market, or which believes business is a good thing, or which believes in a smaller state. Never. Every part political party in India is statist. You know, the one one word in the preamble which has not been objected to is that India is a socialist country. It says in the preamble, India is a secular socialist. Uh, democratic Republic. And not even the BJP has challenged it. Once more and more, BJP used to say they are a Gandhi and Socialist Party. I won't go into that, that episode, but you know, whatever Gandhi and Socialism is. So nobody in, in politics in India, there is no secular right wing in the sense of Second Third Party in UK or Republican Party in US. People who believe in business, who believe in lower taxes, who believe in, in more human, you know, more economic freedom, they believe in the party like that. So you have left wing, and then you have a religious right wing. And to that extent, when BJP was not in power, there was the ABBP was a revolutionary radical movement. I mean, in during the emergency, which are all of you trained to know. Uh, the ABVP was a very, very strong force fighting in the Rebani. Arun Jaitley, for example, was very sadly died recently. He was an ABVP leader in Delhi. He was just trying to escape from the police and not go to jail. But <coughs> now, because uh, uh, BJP has become the ruling party, the ABVP is no longer a radical party. I mean, they they, they, they may be pretty, uh, uh, you know, punchy and militant, but they're not right. They are the status quo party. But even then, I think there's still there's a battle going on in India between the ideology of secularism and, and uh, religious uh, nationalism. So, what, you know, normally, I mean, my, my, my own experience was when, not, not when I was actually studying, but when my first job, <coughs> In, uh, in America was in Berkeley, California, where there was one of the first student movements of post-war period, it's called the free speech movement. Uh, and all it was because they wanted to back the civil rights movement, rights of the black, Afri uh, black Americans. And you know, students were going to get arrested and things like that. Natural that students would be of that kind of, uh, that's what being young means. Being young means being rebellious or nothing. I mean, other than my, I will not be young just to get old and come, come back to being young later on. Um, so, in India, of course, traditionally, the left used to be much more powerful than it is right now. When I was, a, when I was your age, uh, sort of slightly younger, a teenager, um, there was no doubt in anybody's mind that India would become communist. If the question was not if, the question was when. Seriously, you, you can't imagine the power of the Soviet Union as a political image. It was the future. Seriously, it was the future. And our cultural influences very much came from writers like uh, Kosambi, whom you may or may not have heard of. Uh, if you ever want to read a destruction of all ideas of old Indian culture, you read Kasambi, he's amazing. Uh, he was a mathematician by profession, uh, but he knew Pali and Sanskrit and other market and everything. Brilliant right. Uh, but you know, and the cinema was very left wing, you know, you had uh, a bit of the poems and all that. Uh, all that is wrong. The Communist parties are, are kind of, you know, tiny shadows of themselves compared to what they used to be. But surprisingly, in the student body, when the students are angry, they have nowhere else to go but to the left. 
you know, well, 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 students would not go to the Orthodox, would not go to the accepted religion. And that's what being student means. Being student means you, you, you are agitational, you are oppositional, uh, you don't like the society, you want to change it. When you really want to change things, when you my age you want to preserve things, okay, but that, that's a natural <coughs> biological politics. And so you have, uh, you have, I'm, 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 I'm very impressed, I would say, that uh, I arrived this time in this country on the 16th of December. And by the 17th, the country has begun to explode, the Jamia exploded in that. For the last, what, four weeks, in the most sustained student movement I have seen in the, in the last since 1970s, there has been anything like this. And now with the social media, there is much more interconnections across campuses. And uh, of course the state is more sophisticated as well, but that is different. What is true is what we did not have in those days was there was a young student body who was uh, pro-government. Because in those days, even if the Congress had a youth wing, it was never anything, any powerful enough to stand up to the left wing. So you now have, you know, you have street fights between A, B, 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 and whatever it is. Because that is that, that's kind of clash. India is going to be one of the most interesting clash of ideas ever before than ever before. You like it or not, but it is really still uh, the no notion of why India is a nation has still not been set. And it is, it is a question which has haunted India for 200 years. Because the British came. <coughs> the Muslims were ruled by that there's no notion of nation until the 19th century. No, no matter what people may say about Bharat, Russia and all that, forget about all that. The idea that a people constitute a nation is an idea coming out of the French Revolution. Nowhere else, nowhere else. And then they started, people started to what is a nation much more after the First World War. In the First World War, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is a large European continental empire, broke out. <coughs> and come to the Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Bulgaria. They became nations. And the question was, who was a Hungarian? Or who was a Pope? And if there were German-speaking people living in Poland for 200 years, they said, but you're not us. You don't speak Polish. Out you go. And those kinds of issues, what is a nation, began to be discussed in early 20th century. Just about time in India, <coughs> India was formulating its own views of why it was a nation. The British said, you're not a nation. British said, you're not a nation. You just see a jumble of uh, languages and, and peoples and races and so on, you know. So the Indians began a story of why they were a nation. And one story, of course, comes from uh, uh, Samaj. Uh, because the Christian missionary said, uh, what is your book and who is your God? Instead of saying we have many gods and we have many, we get lost. Uh, the idea, we have to find a book. Why? We find Rigveda. Rigveda is not just the only book for Paul in music. It's one of many. It may be the oldest, who knows. But it, 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 it's not the only book. But we had to follow that idea, their definition of religion, we had to follow. And we got trapped. And we're still in the trap. We're very happy in that trap. Uh, and uh, so then, then there are what we call social secular ideas and nationalism. Mm -hmm. But these are all important ideas in nationalism. And you go to somewhere like Assam, right now, over the last, last 50 years in Assam, more than 50 something. Assam thinks it is a nation. And its cultural existence is threatened. Okay? Now, I have this very uh, unfashionable belief that India is a nation of nations. <coughs> India is a collection of nations. It's collected with every people.
people have to decide what sort of nation they are. And I think what proved to be the case was that the first answer, it's not quite the first answer, but the first post-independence answer, was very much determined by the crisis of partition. And secularism is basically a kind of answer to the partition. But it remained an elitist uh, answer. It didn't actually sink down. You can be tolerant. This is another thing. Being secular is another thing. And so, well, the, the Hindu Rashtra idea, uh, in which I've lived with for eight years, but I'm, I'm not a Hindu Rashtra writer. I'm, I'm, I'm actually an atheist, but that's another story. Uh, the Hindu Rashtrawadi story is now competing as a national narrative. My view is that Hinduism is not a single thing. Hinduism is not a single religion. It's not even a religion, but that's another story. Uh, because, uh, you know, how many people know about Murugan? Do you worship Murugan? You don't worship Murugan. In the South, they worship Murugan. Who is Murugan? Murugan is Kartikeya, who has no status in North India. You know, he's a kind of junior to Ganesh, as a child of Shiva. Well, he may have six heads, but so what? Uh, but Murugan is a big god in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the South. Uh, now, say the Bhakti movement. Not many people know that the Bhakti movement started in the South. The Tamil, the Tamil Bhakti poems from the first century AD are where Bhakti started and then it came to North India. We don't even know the history of Hinduism. Okay? So my view is that Hinduism is not a single single, single doctrine. The Hindi belt is a nation. It is a Hindi speaking nation. It is the most populous nation. But it's not India. But the Hindus will kill us. People will work it out. If you somebody will tell a good story and maybe maybe the BJP people tell a good story, we don't know that. You have to give people a story which people can take with them generation to generation of why they are a nation. But if you have a many nations, it doesn't really matter. I know I know you're shaking your head because you can't believe it, but uh, uh, you know the linguistic states were formed in 1956. A huge amount of riots all over the place. Uh, but you know, this is where we have Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu is practically an independent country, if you think about it. No North Indian political party has ever won an election since 1967. You know, it will secede and nobody will notice. It could cut itself off, you know. <laughs> So, uh, or, or Assam, look, look at Assam. Very What's happening in Assam? The CAA, for example, is in, opposed in Assam for exactly the opposite reason. What is opposing on the mainland? Actually, Assam is called India mainland. If you go to Assam, they say, what does the mainland think about us? Uh, they're very isolated. But Assam is against CAA not because it excludes uh, Muslims, but because it is too inclusive because it has moved the deadline from 1971 to that they are outraged. Because it will include many more refugees as citizens. They don't care if they are Hindu or Christian, they just don't want them. They don't want these non assamese to come back. And, so it's a, and if you have the same thing, you know, Maharashtra is made, you know, Maharashtra jobs for Maharashtra people. Kaveri water for Karnataka, not for Tamil Nadu. I mean, how many river water districts that are going on in India? The Punjab and Haryana and Tamil Nadu. So, there is that consciousness, local, regional, national consciousness. But, it will sort itself out. You know, we, we don't have to worry about being a nation, but we are worried. It's an ideological problem. Now, who is next? I will ask. You will ask. No. I, okay. I will ask you two fun questions. <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> one uh, on my behalf and on behalf of oh, my bride's Yeah, yeah. I tell you. Is uh, doing economics a waste of time? That's a question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, doing economics according to the American Economic Association is a waste of time according to the World Economics Association. <laughs> So Which stupid, is uh, if they were stupid, how could they know the answer? No, 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 I'm just putting the question like this. So if I turn to World Economics Association, there are many schools, the so-called heterodox economics. And to some extent, uh, Kaushik Bhatt, who heading the International Economic Association also, is slightly tilted in favor of World Economics Association. Now, as a student, uh, undergraduate, postgraduate, what is there for me? I mean, it's all intellectual controversies. Uh, is there anything, in your opinion, an ideology-free economics that works or that does not work? How can I distinguish so that I have faith in doing economics as a useful subject for the work? This is one question. The second question is, since you are from the Labour Party, in terms of uh, a futuristic vision, do you think eco-socialism is the way forward for uh, uniting the eco -socialism. Uh, e ecological socialism? Because from the labor side, I don't uh, personally see any global uh, uh, agenda towards a socialist project. Uh, e uh, ecological socialism will unite ultimately, eventually, the mankind. Uh, let me, let me answer it just a bit. I didn't even know there was a World Economic Association. Anyway, I tell you, you know, a lot of people say economic unrealistic, it's too theoretical, it's too much radical. Uh, the, the, the deceptive thing about economics is that it seems to talk about practical matters. It seems to talk about practical matters in a very impractical way. All right? And uh, I've had a lot of debate. Uh, there's a colleague of mine in the House of Law called Robert Skidelsky, who wrote a very good biography of Keynes, 311. He, he's always going on about oh, how unrealistic economics is. And I said, you know, in the 15th, 16th century in, uh, in, in, in Europe, people trained for theology. They trained for the church. And they became ministers. Well, the most influential minister man called Thomas Cromwell, uh, who was the minister to Henry VIII. Uh, he, he was basically a, you know, a training for the church. And there was a cardinal, there were cardinal Woolsey and people like that. Now what is going on? You see, theology is a very unrealistic value, depending on what you believe in God or not, very unrealistic subject. But it sharpens the mind. Economics is a way of sharpening the mind. And because it's unrealistic, it is adaptable to any subject whatsoever. This is what I think the advantage of economics is. Economists can go and run anything you like. Because they're not they are not weighed down by descriptive realism of any kind. What an economy in corner? And that I basically so I do a lot of these things. I look at politics and I say, now, why would anybody do this? Let me try and imagine that behavior, that assumption. What are they trying to maximize? Of course, they won't succeed, but they, they have to be rational to be able to do this particular thing. What, in their view, is the rational argument for doing what they're doing? Why did the government pass CAA? and talk about NRC. You know what, what is the, because there must have some logic. Now, I think, uh, unfortunately, that, that after a long study of economics, my view is that that is where the power of economics is. Because, you know, economists, they, they, they are in MBA things, they will run companies, they, they run countries. They, if any of you was made the finance minister tomorrow, you'd have no problem. You could do it. Because, it's the abstraction which is the power, not the realism. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm 
I passionately believe that this is the economics of all the social sciences. The one which gives most power for people, transferability of thinking power to other areas, which an anthropologist would not have. Anthropology is a very good subject. Anthropologists observe reality very closely. They analyze it, they do field work. Sociologists always tell us our government is not anything like culture. Of course, you don't have any culture. But it doesn't matter. Uh, we could think of why do people follow certain cultural practices kind of rationally. I mean, it's, a, it's not that economics is infallible, but it is a very flexible thinking too. I mean, we've been to all varieties of different uh, theoretical structures. Uh, I mean, for, you know, like, nobody really knows Marxian economics, but actually it is a very systematic body of, body of knowledge which, uh, which can be taught. It, it's very similar to classical economics, but different from classical economics. And you can theoretically talk about Marx. You can talk about Marxian economics without having to talk about that. I can tell you. Which is an in India, but that's a lot. But you know, so <coughs> classical, neoclassical, Marxian, Austrian, you know, all these thought systems, they all share one thing. They use abstraction. They use abstraction and they 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 more is always assume rationality. And a strong rationality, we should rationality. I mean, there's nothing in Marx's own economics which deviates from anything that a classical economist said. I mean, his challenge was, can I accept every assumption of classical economics and subvert it from within? So that was his training as a philosopher. So, he doesn't say, oh, the market doesn't work. That'd be too stupid a statement for him to do it. Uh, sorry to say. So, it's an abstraction which gives you the power to think on matters other than the matter of whatever you've been taught. So the details of what you learn about the Indian economy or whatever, it doesn't matter. They'll be forgettable. But you'll be able to, to put you somewhere and some of us look and now think of my strategy for countering China and you'll sit down and you'll think it through. There's no problem. And no you will do that. Why? Because economics is that kind of trend. It's a very peculiar subject. That's why my whole life is a very peculiar subject. But I'm now convinced that a realism is not required necessarily. I mean, I can if I want. But realism lets you know. Realism allows you to tackle that one problem. But then what? And there's no end to realism. I can spend my entire life describing the Delhi, Delhi city economy. And I soon will be finished. But I can talk about urban economy like that. So anyway, that's one. Now the second question was about ecological socialism. Ecological. You know, I don't know that socialism is ecological. Yes, there's a Green Party, and I think some sort of challenges of the Green Party. And in a sense, there are a lot of e uh, Green Party, which are still remains small, but of graining in incomes in Europe, at least. They, they are socials in the, only in the sense that they challenge orthodox economics. You know, they do, not for, they do not want to follow the market rules of allocation and so on. And they believe that there's a better way of allocation compared to what the market prices remain right. And of course, then you, they have to show that it is a realistic alternative, i.e. it's a feasible <coughs> alternative. The world can be made to work, i.e. the people's incentives will, will be compatible with the policies and behavior required by the government. The Greens expect us to behave in a certain way. <coughs> but economics is we are all selfish, which is the easiest assumption to make. Easy to try because that, if you overcome that, then the rest is easy. You know, the Greens, you may believe in altruism, you may believe in idealism and all that. But economics always economizes on idealism. 
Economic greed, forget about all that. If some people are selfish, how can then I provide them incentives to behave in an ecologically friendly way? So to that extent, I think, I think we, we, we can got caught in socialism for a very peculiar reason. That the world went through in the middle of the 20th century, the intense phase of industrialization. In the there was war. There were factories in the working class, the classical working class. And because of the Russian Revolution and so on, for about 50 years, there was Leninist socialism and there was uh, democratic socialism in the UK and France. All the politics had a socialist party, had a communist party. And the socialist parties were based upon factory workers their rank and time. The third, so thing is left Europe. I mean, all manufacturing in Asia, there's no manufacturing in Europe. It's servicing. Economies are making servicing economies. And socialism was very much hung up on nationalization, national ownership of capital. That it was thought that was the most important thing, at least for the commanding heights of the economy. Now, what are the commanding has the world economy? Apple, Google, uh, Amazon, and what, Microsoft? Walmart. Not one of them manufactured anything. Four largest corporations in the world today are non-manufacturing entities. So the, 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 the big importance of manufacturing is kind of gone. <coughs> I think what people believe by socialism is, hello, to be redistributed as far as possible, to worry about uh, the fact that the lowest level of living should be high enough to be respected. You know what, what's called the Rawls rule in, in, in economic justice, that the worst off should not be too badly off. But that, that is not necessarily just a socialist idea. Anybody at the root can have that, that idea. If you want. But the paraphernalia of socialism of public ownership is no longer thought to be all that important. I believe in the case. Uh, in UK, I, I've been in, during my 49 years on the Labour Party, I've been to my game and uh, Mrs. Thatcher came and dismantled all that stuff. And the Labour Party survived and Tony Blair got elected and then he found there's two things to do without public ownership. And our latest election, the Labour Party tried to go back to classical socialism and completely got rejected. Because you know, people people don't want to know about whether you the water resources are open, owned by the state or not. Because they don't trust the state to be a good economic actor. Once upon a time we thought the state would be the good economic actor. In law of Indian politics, is still hung up on that. But there's no reason why this is because state like is people. There's no such thing as a state. Uh, so <coughs> that kind of critical knowledge has come to us. And we said good economic performance is good economic performance. Some may be done by the state body, some may be still done by private. And in terms of productivity enhancement and innovation, there is no doubt that the market does better than the state. And an ecological thing, again, it is the same kind of history will arrive. And then my, my view, my, my own private view is that there's too much emphasis in ecological movements on collective public action. But collective public action is very, very difficult to achieve. Because you may believe that we have a global common interest, but we don't have a global common interest. You know, interests of poor countries are very different we know they're very different in terms of the environment growth trade-off than a rich country. Just as in any ordinary society, the consumer preference of the rich are different from the consumer preference of the poor. I mean, that's not a surprising thing. In the economics, we had a very technical debate in the early 50s on whether you could construct a social welfare function or not. And the conditions are very stringent. The conditions are, I'll just be a bit technical, that basically consumer preferences are independent of income level. 
i.e. angle curves, if you know what angle curves are, angle curves are parallel at all income levels. So my preference for uh, necessities versus uh, luxuries, income elasticity, are the same for the poor and the rich. Now, we know that is not true, but that's required. What that means in ecological context is that the preference between growth and pollution are similar records, but so they're not. And therefore, again, again I, I, I remember in 1973, or 1973, there was a slogan, one week to save the world. And it did There was a big meeting in Stockholm, on and around. And 50 years later, they're still telling me, there's been a one year to save the virus. <coughs> well, what I think will happen, it, it will be some combination of technology, <coughs> habits, and prices. I think that's the three things. And technology is changing if we, if we have electric cars and all sorts of other things. Uh, I recently did something where very, very innovative thing of using low level carbon uh, thing to, to do something very rapid. Somebody, some Indian in Australia has invented and we do. So technology, technology has changed quite a bit in the last last uh, uh, few years. So technology may change and get us a better better environment outcome. Our habits can change. What 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 the uh, what a greater Thunberg can do <coughs> is maybe persuade us to change our habits, <coughs> even in small ways. And then of course prices can change. You know. Every time an oil price goes up, the environment improves. Um, and, and the silly thing, between 1973, when the first oil shock came, and later, the uh, GDP per unit of, uh, of energy has gone. We have learned to economize, it may not look like it, because the incomes are much higher, in, the income level of the last 50 years, overall growth rate has been quite, quite good. And much more spread across the globe than before. It's a spectacular line that, that, that 1945 onwards, global growth has been absolutely spectacular, which is why the pressures on the energy. But in terms of the energy, a GDP per unit of energy, we are doing better, not much better. So, I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic. You know, I've arrived to 80 and not yet been smoked out of the, the world. I've <coughs> not been smoked out. And you, 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 you will not live to carry the banner when you're 50, you know, two more days left to save the world. <coughs> it's it remarkable uh, <coughs> that people are seeing the same thing as me. My, for, for me, for my generation, it was not climate change. It was nuclear destruction. <laughs> it was a serious, serious threat. I mean, I've, I've lived through a time when the Cuban Missile Crisis took place. When Kennedy got on the television, you know, television and said any, any missile which lands in Cuba and launched from that will be regarded as an attack by the Soviet Union of America and will destroy it. And you know, that was it. There's no escape from it. Literally, the whole world is going to be So, there will be a crisis, if you're lucky. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Have I answered your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah one, one, one more. Well, I think eco, yes, socialism, maybe. Any, anybody? Sir, how is your diploma program? We are badass by design for our students. You are the, the course you have designed as a bridge course to yeah. go abroad. Please show some, show some light on your, how you have designed the... Well, my, the, the uh, Yeah. No, see that I, I, I'm completely innocent. Uh, I didn't do anything about that. It is so much students who, unlike me, had prospered. They made a lot of money. And they wanted to establish the LSC master's degree course in India. And so I said, well, go ahead, do it. Can, can we use your name? I said, if you use my name, it has to be extremely difficult. <laughs> and totally heartless. 
story. <laughs> and he will get thrown out of the court after first time in the same sort of time frame. <coughs> and the typical recruits of it should be graduates from engineering, economics, or elsewhere. And uh, it's, it's quite, quite, a, quite a tough thing because the, the summer course is the stats and maths if you have not done enough. But when you arrive, if you've not been into the course, you still take an exam in stats and maths. It's only after you pass that you're allowed to go into the coursework. And then there's the micro, micro econometrics. And then there's selectives in the second term. Uh, but we've now, <coughs> now uh, I don't know what you will say. I forget now what the latest quantitative method is. Not numerical analysis, what, what is it called? Uh, data analytics. Hmm? Data. Data. data analytics and all that. Uh, we used to teach econometric, now we're teaching data analytics. Machine learning. Machine learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and the the emphasis in the second semester is on, on finance. Uh, finance is the most normal. There's public policy as well as finance. Again, but basically you have to pass the exam at the end of first semester to go to the second semester. Otherwise you throw that. Seriously throw that. I mean, uh, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, Indian students are very good at excuse. The <laughs> even number of aunts and uncles die. Grandparents <laughs> die. A week before the exam. And so they have only morning or they are good questions. You said nothing to it. That's your problem. Oh. They said that they don't need to take exam, they will take exam. Period. And say it. Because one of the problems is that you have to treat people like adults who are responsible for what they do. And if they can't promise, they got to fulfill it. Because you're not going to survive otherwise. The degree is not a piece of paper. It's a matter of accomplishment of some kind. So that's what happens. And then you have to write a dissertation. And uh, the dissertation is marked and that's it. But the more important thing is every graduate it's placed in a job before they graduate. That's a great achievement. Of it. We, we actually train people for job uh, interviews and placements and things like that. So practically everybody does that. There are only about 35, 35, 40 students. Want to give this one. The Bombay University wanted us to take over their undergraduate course, but there's nothing there. The undergraduate is a very difficult. Uh, yeah. Because 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 you want to train them on all lots of other things before you can specialize them. Mm -hmm. You know, specialize is specialization. Undergraduates can't be specialized. They have a much broader <coughs> thing to go through. <coughs> but <coughs> so far successful. We've done about three or four years, and uh, it, it's a. We have just changed, you know, because in India you can't, you can't actually run a university just because it is good. It has to be affiliated to somebody. So we were affiliated to Bombay University. Now we are affiliated to Berkeley School. But and the quality is in the knowledge you have, not who you affiliated to. Yeah. But it is, it is, I would say, if you have nothing better to do in your life, don't do that as well. I'd make that this time. Yes, sorry. Yes, sir. Um, so my question was uh, that how India is obviously going in an economic downturn right now, but how should what should be the government stance in this situation? Because there's one side of economists who are arguing that it's a structural problem that non-banking financial so economists such as uh, Arvind Subramaniam and Raghuram Ranjan say that there's a pin balance sheet problem, something. There is a structural problem. On the other hand, there are people like Abhijit Banerjee who say that there is a consumption problem and government should more focus on the consumption part rather than the structural problem. Absolutely. So what should the government policy, in, how should government intervene in this situation or whether the government should even intervene or not because monetary is suggested. Well, I, I, I get your question. It's no problem. Uh, you see, it's more interesting. Uh, uh, I, Every other Monday I write an article in the Financial Express. Mm -hmm. Slightly more technical than I write for uh, Indian Express. Anyway, 
I, I did this about, about three months ago. So Indian economy, well basically you can forget the first 40 years. The Indian economy is born in 1991. Or, uh, and uh, in the last, whatever it is, 30 years, until now, now uh, it has achieved a decent rate of growth. <coughs> but in the 21st century, it has really got into a situation where India is only country where four and a half percent growth rate is thought to be a recession. I was mean, it. No So Indians are going through growth cycles. Not levels the level of income, but in the growth rate of income. And you can say that roughly speaking from well the twenty years of uh, the 21st century, there was an earlier cycle before the 2008 crash, about five or six year cycle, growth rate went up, growth rate came down. And then since 2011, we have had another longer cycle of seven, eight years, growth rate went up, and then it has come down. Well, that was basically the first time India is behaving like a, a, a modern capitalist economy in which credit plays a major role in driving investment. Uh, you know, the classical, the, the standard theories of business cycle, it was the first one by Michael Wicksell in the 19th century, was about the bank rate is low, a rate at which banks lend is low, profit rate is high, so everywhere falls. And then there is always an overshoot. Uh, and finally, banks run out of the reserves, whatever it is. Or in the, those days, the gold standard, the gold has left the country, and the interest rate has to go up. Interest rate goes up with a crash. Now, in India, the parallel was basically the NPAs of the PSU banks, which the government did finally begin to sort out with the uh, insolvency and bankruptcy code. But, you know, as soon as you get the judiciary, everything is delayed in. The one thing designed to delay is the judiciary. So the appellate, so the court, the appellate court. But anyway, so that, uh, uh, the credit market dysfunction, both in the bank credit market and the non-bank credit market, the ILFC crash. It's a classic example of a business cycle crash. So the problem in the Indian economy right now is not the Keynesian problem of lack of effective demand. It is the problem of lack of credit to revive investment. And I think what, what the Reserve Bank of India has been doing is been quite smart in their thing what's called operation twist. They are they are lowering the long-term rate of interest and raising the short-term rate of interest. You know, they're twisting the yield curve. And I think a lot of liquidity has to be provided to banks who could then lay. Because the driving force from now on in the economy would be investment, private investment. But that awareness is not quite sunk into the policy-making uh, circles. Because the budget, last July's budget, was everybody thought it was a Keynesian problem. Consumption was down, we had to do something, got to do And you know, so the consumption is down, give more money to Manrega. Manrega consumption is not going to solve any country's problem. I mean, it's good for the poor, but it's not going to solve the, the Maruti car problem. <laughs> okay, the Maruti car problem is a different kind of problem than the Manrega problem. So, I mean, one has to be intelligent about the standard Keynesian policy. And I, I actually am completely opposed to corporate tax cuts because corporations, ta corporations collect tax cuts and never invest. I mean, there are a lot of empirical evidence across <coughs> different countries in clothing that corporate tax cuts don't help, but that's right. They love corporate tax cuts. But I think to finalize the last one, it was a theory. And the economy has not actually been sorted out very much. What is 
slight faint signs. Then basically all cycles turn around. Ultimately the bottom is not bottomless. Ultimately things happen where replacement investment is going on and then there's the renewal and so on. So I think there's a few signs of things. What's called the purchasing managers index or whatever it is. Running up slightly up in manufacturing and in services. So I don't think doing nothing is an option. But I think it is a monetary policy problem, not a fiscal policy problem. I, so I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm an old teacher, I go on and on. Uh, uh, <coughs> India there is a fiscal policy bias. Not only fiscal policy bias, but there is a direct action bias. The actually thing that we can only do things by direct intervention. Not just providing incentives and signals for the economy to react. Because very paternalistic attitude towards the economy. The government is going to run the economy. The government can't run the economy. Anyway, uh, so the sophisticated policy mixes are known but not used properly in India. A lot of maturity yet to come. We'll see. They're all grown. Uh, sorry, you wanted to ask the government a question? There's one step from here. Okay. Okay. I think we're losing the gender bias, you know? Yeah. Uh, this is kind of, yes. So, sir, like, uh, in my opinion, like, if, if you make a comparison between the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, in the state that uh, uh, historically there was a difference between the two parties as the economic left and the economic right, the free market and uh, socialism. Right now, like, what we see in the United States is that shifting to more political right versus the political left, but this more protectionism of the country as a whole. And uh, if I make this comparison of the amount of immigration which happens in the United States and the United Kingdom, it's similar. So why do, uh, why do you think like right now in the United Kingdom the change to a political right versus political left hasn't happened, uh, especially on the uh, conservative slash Republican side, or is it bound to happen in the long run, uh, or why the public hasn't reacted? So the politicians only react to what general sentiment is. Well, you know, I mean, first of all. The, the big difference in size between the two countries and the history of the And the history, they've been both the English speaking countries and the history of the very, very different. And uh, in a sense, uh, one common thing which happened to both those economies from the oil shock of 1970s onwards is that both the English realized. Is it manufacturing left the shores of Western Europe and America and went to Asia? And because you know, it's kind of classical Marx thing, <coughs> capital decided to move. Capital is no nation. Capital doesn't follow any flag, it follows profitability. And the capital decided the more profit to be made in Asia, so they said, we move. That, that, that's one of Asian industrialization of the 1970s, 1980s, you know, the Asian tigers and all that. Now the hollow, and what happened in both economies, is service sector became prosperous. The service sector is for skilled people. The unskilled and semi-skilled people got their good fortune for manufacturing. So that, the backwardness of that section of society, in America, it's concentrated in the Midwest. People who support it. In UK, it's in the north of England and on the South Sea coast and so on. And Brexit is exactly what happened in both places. That people who felt they were uh, disadvantaged, would not be disadvantaged, uh, had to blame somebody. And so they blame Europe in the UK. Uh, in uh, in uh, America, they blame Washington in a whole democratic, liberal democratic uh, ethos. And so Trump won because of that. And, uh, now, in a sense, uh, again, in both contexts, there's much more political uh, uh, uniformity. So the Democrats and Republicans are like Mexico and Coca-Cola. Because they're similar, you have to exaggerate the differences. <coughs> but politically, they're not very different. In, in 
in UK a little bit more, but not all that much because both parties are coalitions. And sometimes uh, the Conservative Party defines the most definitely right wing, like when Thatcher did. And when Tony Blair became like, he went to the middle of the road, abandoned the left. And then, but ultimately, I think there is more common politics because um, politics makes a difference at the margin. The private economy works most of the time. And politics works at the margin, although we exaggerate its effect. In, I mean, for example, in my view, Brexit is not going to make much difference uh, to the British economy because the quality of the people is such that they will respond to any challenge. The people are innovative, very resilient, risk-taking, and do not rely on the state. So then, once the uncertainty is over, they manage. I mean, it is the fifth richest country, the population of one fifteenth of what India is. So the, the per capita income is 15 times. So, and that comes from, for example, in the area of fintech. The fintech model was invented in UK. And why? Because people were left free to start whatever they want to start. You now there's a thing called sandbox. I don't ever heard the word sandbox. Sandbox is when you let people start companies without much regulation. Wait till they grow up, then we find out, and then you put regulation. Then you go, you go in this box and that one. In sandbox, like when children are playing in a the, in the sandbox, they still shape this. You know, they, they don't, we don't know what they're going to do. Now, that kind of attitude of policy maker, let people and know, let them see, let them see what they do, and then, then we will regulate. And then, if you make money, you keep that money, more or less. Is those attitudes are what you know, people <coughs> genuinely believe in the market. In India, they don't. I mean, what, what, what can you do with that? I mean, India is probably the most market-oriented economy traditionally, has been for 3,000 years. But the intellectuals and politicians don't believe in the market. Why? Because they're all westernized. What can you do? Um, it's a paradox, but anyway. Um, so, I think. Uh, I think both UK and US have, have that quality, but US is larger and got more, so, more social differences, and serious class problems, are less than that. But much more than much more than UK. But the populism is a is, is sort of political response. Why not? Well, oh, Oh, oh yeah. So uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, firstly, uh, why do you feel that uh, in regards to the uh, recent elections in Britain, uh, do you feel the conservatives won because just like India, the opposition failed to reach to the masses, or was it some other reason altogether? And secondly, sir, you said that uh, in Britain you feel that Brexit won't have much of an impact. But till a deal is drafted, how far do you feel the other facets of the economy or the country as a whole, rather? Uh, is going to be affected by the British legislation majorly grapples with the Brexit deal. Yeah, but you know, first, first, first of all, in the first question, in a sense, in any equation, the winners win because they're good and losers lose because they're bad. But uh, what, what, you know, because the party, you know, we have been the very peculiar thing since 2010, and after 13 years of the rule the Labour Party lost, we have had four elections. In nine years, okay. you know, not, not, not after that. 2010, there was no majority, so we had a coalition government. 2015, there was a bare majority, Cameron. So the Conservative Party was so divided on the issue of Brexit that he had to have a referendum. They had a referendum not because they were party, because his party was divided on the question of Europe. He resigned because he lost the referendum. Theresa May called an election, she lost the majority. Right? Now the paradox also is that when the coalition government was in power in 2010, conservative and liberals, the liberals wanted to have a law passed that halfway through conservatives won't dissolve parliament. And they ditched them. 
So there is a fixed term parliament act which says parliament cannot, the prime minister cannot suddenly in mixed term uh, in an election unless two thirds majority, whatever it is. In that context, we've had more elections in a, in, in a, since 1915 than uh, three elections since 1915. So the Conservative Party is divided, and it really went down when, when, uh, when uh, Theresa May lost her, her bill, her big bill, the three times. And they have, so unlike, unlike the Communist Party here, the Conservative Party actually has a machinery for electing a leader. Every political party in the UK has a machine elected leader. Only in India they don't have. Better wait for the son and the grandson. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, Theresa May technically could have continued, despite all the fits of Prime Minister, but she voluntarily resigned on request of that. And uh, Boris Johnson. The Boris Johnson is very simple. I've been trying to be Prime Minister for it. very simple. He fought, he saw that everybody was exhausted with Brexit, especially very angry with Parliament. And when the people had voted in the referendum for Brexit, Parliament went on inventing a variety of ways not to Brexit, but to somehow continue the old relationship under some guys or another. I mean, I voted for Remain, but I have always believed that once the referendum was done, no matter how large the majority, Brexit has to be delivered. But my party didn't know. My party was very divided on that. Uh, and so, you see, the elite wanted to remain in Europe and like this and all that. And the people were fed up with you. They said, democracy the people are right, no matter what. And give the people what they want. That's what Brexit, that's what Boris Johnson said. Get Brexit done. He only had one line in Mary first told him, get Brexit done. All other branches of the policy were kept outside the election. And of course my party had a had an elaborate triple nationalization and this and that. Um, and the people said, listen, all that can wait. Sort this out. And then overwhelmingly, I mean we've never had the Conservative Party win in Northern England for quite about 50 years. And for a Conservative, for a British Prime Minister, a majority of 90, he just conferred. <coughs> so it worked because the message was simple. The priority was Brexit. And now, how Brexit is shaped? First of all, we have to legally go out, become a third country. And then we have one year for negotiating and the new new relationship between the EU and the UK about the trade agreements. Now there are there have been lots of discussions beforehand and all that. Uh, Boris Johnson hasn't has partic uh, deliberately put a deadline for December 2020. The bargaining for it may have not go like that. But ultimately, a lot of those things are in place. The only thing we don't want is free movement of labor between EU and UK. And we will have to have a, there's a Norwegian model and there's a Canada model. One of those models will be taken up. 